turn your Bible. Uh, Psalm one ten, verse one through seven. Sin을 바꿔. Second worship. Psalm 110, verse 1 through 7. We're going to hear God's word together. Here's the word of God. change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He will shed our kings on the day of his wrath. He will execute judgment among the nations, filling them with corpses. He will shed our cheeks over the wide earth. He will drink from the brook by the way. Therefore, he will lift up his head. Amen. Perfect time. Psalm oh, that's enough. Uh, that's for next week. Um, <clears throat> um, we are uh, reading Psalm of David uh, every Sunday. And uh, as we really um, read his confession, his prayer, uh, like I said, we need to make his prayer, his confession, as our confession. Uh, that's really important. Um, if we just study oh, how he wrote that and what the meaning of it, uh, but that's not important, right? If we cannot uh, really apply that or make it uh, our own, then that's his confession. And we get some kind of information about him and his poem. But um, we try to make his confession, his psalm, as our psalm, as our confession. And there are various kinds of uh, psalms in Book of Psalm. Um, there's a um, Thanksgiving psalm, and there's a uh, royal psalm, and all those uh, psalms. But in... Um, as one of them, there's a messianic psalm. It's pointing at, pointing to uh, the coming Messiah who come. And Psalm 110 is the greatest of the messianic psalms. Let me quote from Edward Reynold. Um, he was one of the best expositors of Psalm 110. He wrote that this psalm is one of the fullest and most commendious uh, prophecies of the person and offices of Christ in the whole Old Testament. You may know uh, Charles Spurgeon, famous Baptist uh, preacher of the 19th century. He taught that um, Psalm 110 is exclusively about Jesus Christ. David is not the subject of it, even in the smallest degree. So, even though he wrote this psalm, but he's not the subject of this. It's exclusively um, about 
Jesus Christ. So, <clears throat> my question is, how could he come up with this sum? If it is not, um, he, this, you know, he's not a subject of this sum, then why did he write this sum? That's my question. So we, we're going to look at it. Um, it's really a short psalm, right? It has seven verses. But you could bring all kinds of uh, truth about God, truth about Jesus Christ throughout this psalm. So if I try to spend you know, a long time to explain it, then uh, I could go on and on. As you know, I, I don't want to, you know, do that. So I really want to shorten it. Um, <clears throat> he's making this confession, and he's saying that Christ is the king. Verse 1, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. This verse was called by uh, uh, several um, New Testament writers. And this is the uh, quote, quotation that people use the most. So, uh, even Jesus Christ himself quote uh, from this psalm. Let's look at the verse. The Lord says to my Lord. Do you get the point? Actually, if you are kind of sensitive to um, the Bible, and there's a lot of versions, right? But... Um, you might find this kind of capitalized lore. Uh, and there's this kind of lore. Uh, different. But some versions just use, do not use this. Um, I'm not going to cross it out. Um, they aren't using this whole capital thing even though it is uh, the same words in Hebrew. The Lord says to my Lord, there's two words of Lord, right? This Lord is the God, the Father. Uh, Heavenly Father, creator of universe. And these Father says to my Lord, who is that? David said, the Lord, we understand God, right? God says to my, my Lord. Yeah, Messiah. the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, how do we really know this? Some of the uh, commentators uh, brought up, um, actually, this is not the Psalm of David. Uh, it's to David. So, Lord says to my Lord, which this is David. But that's not the case. Um, because Jesus himself called he, this psalm to prove that he's the son of God. If you look at Matthew 22, 23, right, 22, verse 41 to 46, Jesus asked Pharisees how David's Lord could also be David's son. Right? Um, can, can we turn to Matthew 22? Matthew 22, verse 41 to 46. 
While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, "What do you think about the Messiah? What do you think about the Christ? And whose son is he?" And they replied, "The son of David." And then Jesus said to them, "How is it then that David, speaking by by the Spirit, calls him Lord? For he says, 'The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my hand, my right hand, until I put your enemies under your feet.'" So Jesus called this psalm, and then he said, "What do you think about Christ? Whose son is he?" And then they said, "The son of David." But how come then David said, "He's my Lord." So he's trying to prove that he's son of God. Um, we're in uh, Wiersbe. The pastor Wiersbe um, mentioned this. What do you think about the Christ? How David's Lord could. Also, be David's son, and the answer he said is by incarnation. The eternal Son of God had to come to Earth as human, born into the family of David. So basically, this psalm, he's kind of trying to remember what the Messiah will come and do, the person and work of Jesus Christ, and offices. Of Jesus Christ. That's why Christ is the King. So, you know the Messiah, right? The Anointed One. He has a three offices: King, Priest, Prophet. Among that, he's uh, talking about the Christ is the King. The Lord said to him, "Right, said to the Messiah, 'Sit at my right hand、uh, until I make your enemies your footstool.' To sit at a king's right hand or God's right hand was more than mere honor, but it was to share in His role, rule." So God told David's Lord, which is the Messiah, the Christ, Jesus, you 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 could sit at my right hand. That's why in in the in the New Testament, Jesus was kind of after his ascend ascension,、uh, he was described. He is what sitting at the right hand of God all the time. Not only just honored to be right next to the God the Father, but he shared his role as a king. So he's the king. Christ is the king, and he rule over every single event, every single issues in your life. And how long? Is he going to sit there until I make all your enemies your footstool? Until the victory, so he's gonna bring ultimate victory. So he's gonna sit at God's right hand until ultimate victory. So he's gonna rule over us. He's gonna take care of us as the king. Until he's gonna bring ultimate victory over his enemies. So last、um, Sunday we talked about enemies, right? We don't need to、uh, really worry about our situation. And another psalm, we you know. Went through. He said, "My heart is fixed. How? 
if you really get to know this truth. Jesus Christ will sit at the right hand of God and He's ruling over all this, what's happening in our world, in our lives, up until your enemies, and Satan, uh, become the footstool. And then He said, The Lord extend your mighty scepter from Zion, saying, Rule in the midst of your enemies. Um, this is not how earthly king rule. If you really think about it, Rule in the midst of your enemies. Think about earthly kings. They don't rule their kingdom in this way. They try to uh, have some kind of boundaries, right? You know, we heard about, you know, we are listening to God's word in the morning. You know, we need to build a city wall. Why? Of protection. So earthly kingdom, earthly king, they have um, boundary and defend and extend their frontiers and confront, fight, and overpower enemies, not ruling in the midst of their enemies. So this can only mean that he is ruling as spiritual ruling over hostile powers of this world. That's why Ephesians chapter 6, our battle is not against blood and flesh, but it's what? Against spiritual forces. So we're living in two kingdoms. So Christ is ruling over uh, us in the midst of his enemies. We're living in this kingdom of the world. At the same time, kingdom in, in God's kingdom, right? So he's ruling in the midst of his enemies. Uh, Martin Luther, in his commentary on this psalm, he said, quote, We must live in the midst of Christ's enemies. However, it is not the meaning of this verse that we physically resist our enemies, which is part of the thinking of Anabaptists and other rebels. In his kingdom, Christ has nothing to do with sickly power and government, nor are we Christians able to defeat and subdue the devil and the world by means of physical power or weapons. Uh, at the time, his enemies were kind of Anabaptist, <laughs> but um, we are not just talking about earthly power, earthly uh, kingdom. Christ's rule is in the midst of his enemies, our enemies, Satan. So uh, not a physical fight. It's a spiritual fight, spiritual battle. And he said, your troops will be willing. like dew from the morning's womb. Um, so he's the king. He shared God's rule up until the ultimate victory. And he's going to rule in the midst of our enemies, Satan, so in the kingdom of the world. And he has troops. He's not going to rule over this uh, world and over us um, with just physical thing, and then he's going to just show up in the, and then destroy them all. And he's not going to do that. And he's going to do it through his troop, church, and all of us, each one of us. 
And he's going to use uh, us. And then we're going to uh, be willing to serve him. Uh, not by coming in power himself but, and in judgment, but later on he's going to do that, but uh, through his people, the church. But his troop will be willing. So when we serve God, when we really um, carry out our calling and commission because we are the heir of Jesus Christ, right? Uh, we're not going to do it by force. We're not going to be forced to do that. But he said, your troops will be willing. So Christ is the king, and he's going to sit at God's right hand, and he's going to share his rule with the authority. That's what Matthew 28, 16 says. You know, he has authority, authority of heaven and earth. I was given by God and make that's why I go and make disciples of all nations. So we're gonna be his troops and then serve God at the same time. And second uh, confession of David was Christ is the high priest. The king is the priest. For us, okay, we could accept that, right? But for Jewish people, for the people of Israel, it's abnormal. The king has never been the priest. None of them. Never the king became some kind of priest. Not at all. King is king. Priest is priest. But David said the king is the priest. If Jesus were on earth, he could not minister as a priest because he was from the tribe of Judah, not from Levi. So he's from the tribe of Judah, right? He cannot be a priest. That's why he said, um, verse 4, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are, the, you are a priest forever in the in the order of Melchizedek. Um, who knows this guy, Melchizedek? Huh? We have three locations we have this kind of name appear in the Bible. Genesis 14, when Abraham won the victory over battle, and he's coming back, and he met this guy, Melchizedek. And all of a sudden, he offered tight to uh, Melchizedek. And at the time, Melchizedek is kind of identified as the king of Solomon. Solomon means uh, peace, king of peace. But his name, meaning of his name is king of righteous, righteousness. So it's really mysterious guy, Melchizedek. And so one thing that we have is Abraham offered his tithe to the king of Salem, Melchizedek. And then Melchizedek, the king of Salem, blessed Abraham. And then Psalm 110, we have his name here. And in Hebrews, 
uh, there are various locations, like a six, eight, seven. So you have his name in Hebrew, Hebrews. Um, Hebrews chapter 7, 3. The writer of Hebrews kind of describe him in this way. Without father or mother, without genealogy, without beginning of days or end of life, like the Son of God remains a priest forever. So Christ cannot, Jesus cannot become a priest because he's from the tribe of Judah. But in the order of Melchizedek, he is the priest. Kind of David is kind of proclaimed that and state that he is the priest in the, in the order of Melchizedek. We don't even know his kind of genealogy. He has no father or mother. He doesn't have beginning and the end. But Abraham offered tight to him. And he blessed Abraham. And then Hebrews kind of claimed that this Melchizedek was the type of Christ. And the priest in Old Testament never sat down. God the Father said to his Lord, sit at my right hand. And the priest in the Old, in the Old Testament they never sat down because their work never done. They were finished. So one by one, after they service as a priest, they couldn't finish the work. That's why after that, they need to pass down their role and their offices to the eldest son. And David said, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. A priest in the Old Testament, they cannot be a priest forever. This is an abnormal thing. Um... Because no Aaronic priest was a priest forever because each high priest died and was replaced by his kind of eldest son. Uh, it's kind of really confusing sometimes, right? Too many information, but this is how David see his Lord. And he knew that what God, God the Father, told his son, Jesus Christ. They never heard about, he never heard about Jesus. He listened to, he heard about the coming Messiah. So Christ is the king. And Christ is the priest. So, what I'm trying to say uh, with this, um, David had him as the foundation of his faith. We, we always like, you know, claim that Jesus, you are the Christ, son of the living God. Is he really? But for David, he was. That's the point. How Jesus called his psalm, his confession, to prove himself as the Son of God. How could he really realize this really important truth? How could he get to know God the Father told his Lord, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, all this? That's my question. How do you get to know that? We learn about it. 
But he made this confession and make a statement. Friday, we are going over this foundations, 10 foundation of uh, faith. David went through various kinds of trials in his life, as you know. Right? We might know this and that. Yeah, Jesus is the Christ, son of the living God, which means he is the king. He is the priest. And he is the prophet. We know that. But there's a big difference between David and us. This was his real foundation of his work of faith. He went through various kinds of trials. He was kind of poorly treated. When he was young, by his family, he was poorly treated, like mistreated. He had a kind of family background. Nobody really, you know, recognized him or give attention to him. Not at all. His father forgot about him. He was poorly treated. That's his fa family background, and that's how he grew up. Later on, he saved the nation, right, country, by killing Goliath, right? But he was falsely accused, and by Paul, King Paul, uh, King Paul, Saul, King Saul, uh, he was chasing him to kill. He was falsely accused, and he was chased by King Saul over decades. Even after he became a king, he was betrayed by his own beloved son, Absalom. And he committed really serious sin. By the law, he might just stoned, might be stoned right away and then be killed. He committed that sins. He went through this kind, you know, and then he was forgiven. But he went through various kinds of trials in his life. And he was able to overcome all of this. And then through these trials, he became complete. Can you get that? That was his foundation of faith, work of faith. Whenever he faced some kind of trials, he doesn't fall into that trials or temptation, not at all, because of this faith foundation. Christ is the king. Christ is the priest. He's ruling over in the midst of his enemies. That king is my king. The Lord said to my Lord, he already made coming Messiah. He never seen him before. He was just heard about it. Even before Jesus Christ came, right? He just saw what? Heard about shadow of the reality. But he made this as his foundation of his faith. That's why he was able to overcome. So you guys have a lot of you know, issues, conflicts, or some difficult times, hardships. The problem is we cannot overcome 
We fall into that situation. We fall into that realities. And we get discouraged. Even though we know that Christ is the king. Christ is the priest. But that, that's not real for us. That's not our foundation of our faith. Work of faith. We need to make it as a foundation of our work of faith. Then we could be stable. And we could say that my heart is fixed. I'm not going to be shaken by any circumstance, any situation. I'm not going to fall into temptation. When I meet various kinds of trials, I will take it as a pure joy. We could say that. If we make this as our foundation of faith. Um, when he was kind of called by uh, King Saul, because he was kind of possessed by evil spirit, as you know, and he was struggling with that. And then he was really great, great uh, musician, right? He is playing harps and then praising God and cast out demons out of King Saul. Remember that? So, Christ was really king. He experienced that throughout this all trials. He personalized the prophecies of coming Messiah. That was real for him. That's the point I want to make. We heard about this. Of course, we cannot come up with, you know, these fancy words. But we need to make this too as our foundation of our faith. We need to really confirm, oh, right, Jesus Christ is the king. He's ruling over us. He is in control. He's a kingdom of, you know, king of kingdom of God. And he is ruling in the midst of enemies. So he came here to destroy the work of devil. So we know the verse, we memorize the verse, but in your life, Satan will put a lot of traps and temptations. If you make this as your foundation of faith and then confirm every single moment. I told you um, uh, I, was being de I was deceived by you know, Satan and my enemies. I fell down so many times. And through all that trials, I confirm, yeah, Jesus is the Christ. And He is true King of kings. You need to come from that. You need to know how to fight the battle. We need to know, yeah, right. Christ has already won the battle. Satan is trying to deceive with the lies. I fell down so many times. You know, as we prepare praise night, like, that's why I, I told you, you know, Satan will attack us. That's what Pastor Sam is kind of, you know, addressing that issue all the time. So we are in really important transition concerning our church situation. Satan will attack. We know that. But we know that Jesus Christ rules in the midst of his enemies. We need to fight the spiritual fight. So confirm that he is the king. He's the priest. We have sinful thoughts, sinful ways. All of them, we are struggling with that. Even though God says yes, we say no. Even though God says, this is the great opportunity for you to confirm the gospel. We said no. You know, God said, if you have various kinds of trials, take it as a pure joy. We said no. That's a sinful thought, sinful way of living. Whenever you have that, whenever you fall down, you need to grab hold on to this. 
of course, I'm sinful. I'm wicked. I have no choice but to go against God's will. Sometimes I don't even know what God's will is all about. But I kneel down and then confirm that, yeah, Christ is the priest. That's why. I cannot even deal with my sinful nature. Only Christ does. And He paid all sins. And He made us as a new creation. So we could come up with a new imprint, new root, new nature. I think Christian life is all about this. We need to make this as our foundation of our faith. Other than that, we have just theoretical information about Jesus Christ. We could study about theology. We need to have that information. But that information cannot save you. Information should be transformation. Christ is the Christ. Should be my Christ. Should be my gospel. King David came up with this psalm. Amazing. I really envy his speciality. His relationship with God. Think about it. Jesus called your word. Your confession. Isn't it great? We spit it out every word. We curse at people like we make fun of people. But when you make some kind of confession, think about it. Creator, Savior, Redeemer, we quote your word. That's amazing. That explains how close relationship he has with God. Even though he committed really serious sin and he went through various kinds of trials, through all that, he come from this. Christ is the king. The king is the priest. And then uh, for him, I think, um, I'm not sure whether he had a Torah. I think he has. Then there's only one place you could find Melchizedek. And he remembered that. And he kind of acknowledged who Jesus Christ is, like a coming Messiah is. And he said, in the order of Melchizedek, the king is the priest. Uh, I want to have that spirituality. I want to really get to know who Christ is in my life. I want to boldly testify and proclaim that Jesus is the king. And Jesus is the priest. And he is true prophet. So he held on to the covenant of grace. So, the bottom of his heart, his faith, these two, was there. Uh, whatever you are, what kind of situation you are in, it doesn't really matter. It's the matter of this. Am I having this as, our, as my confession, like a foundation of our faith, my faith or not? Do I really confess that? Jesus is the Christ, Son of the living God. Realistically. Factually. Um, means we go to the army. Um, he's going to face various kinds of trials, kind of limitation too. It's going to be hard. But I want him to really confirm this through all that, right? Jesus Christ is the king. And Jesus Christ is the priest. So in various kind of situation, trials, um, God has some kind of purpose. 
so that we could become complete, not lacking anything. Um, God is training us through all these trials. We need to make some kind of conclusion that, all right, Christ is the king. And Christ is the priest. So it's not just head knowledge, just knowledge, but uh, our confession, our foundation. Let's pray together. In this, um, there are a lot of, a lot of um, things that we could talk about. Commentators, scholars bring various kinds of doctrines out of this psalm. But my question was kind of different. Of course, it's amazing for, for us to get to know that uh, David, how, how did he really come up with this you know, psalm? Um, but this is his reality. The promises or prophecies of the coming Messiah wasn't just kind of theory or just kind of information. For him, there was power. There was strong power. He was able to overcome various kinds of trials. He never fell into trials. Whenever he fell into trials, he got back up. Um, I want us, all of us, become like this, David. Um, let's pray sincerely. Um, Lord, I, just want, I don't want to just know Jesus Christ with my head. Yeah, of course, I could understand. I could study about Christ. But I want you to become my Christ my Lord, my Savior, my Redeemer. Um, yeah, let's pray.